Hello, my friends. Today is a very good day. We got a pretty cool subject. We are going to be talking about a car that is considered one of the biggest failures in automotive history. A car who, let's just frankly say, style is controversial. A car that Ford gave up on in less than two years after they had invested quite a bit of money. We are going to be talking all about the Etzel. So, let's do it. Now, if you are not familiar with this channel, welcome. It is all things automotive. This is our mechanic shop. We've been in business for over 40 years. Grew up in the mechanic shop, addicted to car museums, and here you find me. If I'm talking about it, odds are I find it tremendously interesting, and I want to share it with you. So, if you like automotive history like I do, press subscribe, press like, and if you don't, that's fine too. It is 1955, and Ford Motor Car Company has begun intense research and development for a car codenamed the E-Car. That stands for experimental. Why branch out and create an all-new line? Well, Ford execs, the whiz kids who have kind of grown up, have decided to take a look at their competition. They are comparing the lineup between General Motors and Ford. And what did they find? Well, they figured out that Lincoln was not actually in competition with Cadillac as they thought. It was in competition with Buick and Oldsmobile. And so they hatched a plan. They decided to move Lincoln and Mercury upmarket, break out the Continental into its own space, and then move the E-car in between Ford and Mercury. Just a little side note, the Continental would be put down after the Mark II lost Ford $1,000 per car sold. I'm not mad about it. That's a glorious car. Happy it happened. Now, to be honest, Ford was coming at this rather cocky. They told their investors, consumers, the press, anyone would listen, that every detail of this car was a result of very specific market research and development. And they kind of thought all that research was gonna entail success. But I think you know where this story is going. But first, let's go ahead and talk about how the e-car became the Edsel. Well, it took a very long and winding journey, I'll tell you that much. But who was Edsel? Edsel Ford was the son of Henry Ford Sr., the father of Henry Ford II, and he was a supreme talent. He's the man that brought you the Continental. He was a man of design, whereas his father was a man of utilitarianism. He also was one of the most beloved men at the Henry Ford Motor Company. And unfortunately, he passed away in his prime due to stomach cancer. It's at this point in time when I talk about, say, Edsel Ford, Dino, Alfredo Dino Ferrari, or Jean Bugatti, I'm like, whoa, wouldn't it have been very fascinating to see where these car makers would have turned out if the sons weren't taken too soon. All of them passed away. Alfredo Dino Ferrari due to, I think it was MS. And Jean Bugatti got taken out in one of the 1939 Le Mans winners, the Bugatti Type 57G tanks. So, something to think about, pretty sad. Okay, sorry for the downer. Now, Etzel had actually been one of the first names that had been suggested, but Henry Ford, the deuce, wanted no part of that name to be on this car. And so the team in charge of deciding a name went ahead and put a couple of parameters out and put it forth at Ford as a competition. And those parameters were kind of interesting. It had to be short. It had to be distinct. It had to start with like a C, an S, or a J. It couldn't start with a K, a W, or an M for some reason. I guess the KW or M could have been too bulky on the side of the car. Anyways. And also, it could not rhyme or translate into something naughty. And so with those parameters, they put forth and they got way too many suggestions to stay sane. And from those suggestions, they actually did pick up a couple that they thought could be contenders. All right. They had the Corsair, the Citation, which 
Who in the world thinks Citation was going to be a good name for a car? Am I missing something? The Pacer and the Ranger. So they had four contenders, but they just didn't really love them. So they went back to the drawing board. And so they decided to outsource it. They sent it off to a marketing company. The marketing company tried their best and Ford still wasn't happy with any of their suggestions. And so then a board member said to heck with this and he reached out to a poet. It was Pulitzer Prize winner Marianne Moore and she happily agreed to offer up some names free of charge. And I'll tell you what, I am not mad at these names. There was the, the Hurricane Asifeter, the Mongoose Savik, the Dearborn Diamante, and the Ford Fabergé, which I'm assuming that's in relation to the Fabergé eggs, the famous Fabergé eggs. Obviously, those weren't picked either. And so very, very frustrated team at Ford decided to just circle back around and go with Edsel. With this experimental car, Ford also decided they wanted to get a little experimental with the marketing. Ford created a top-rated television show. Literally a show that would be nominated for an Emmy. <laughs> Crazy. It was called The Edsel Show, and it was star-studded, featuring Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Louis Armstrong, and there's one more I'm forgetting. Frank Sinatra. That's the name I almost forgot. The show's whole purpose was to promote the Edsel. Now, it's clear that the show was a hit. It got nominated for a freaking Emmy, all right? But unfortunately, that just did not translate to support of the actual car. Along with the Edsel show, Ford also did a series of kind of vague but catchy advertisements, like where you couldn't quite see what the car looked like, like kind of to peak the consumer's interests. That just kind of thing kind of frustrates me personally. Um, so, and, and that was a big contrast to what consumers of the day were used to. They were used to going to large autoramas, big auto shows, and seeing the car and not being teased. Now, the Edsel did come with a couple of cool new features. It had an engine tachometer. It had a speed warning light speedometer, which essentially you set the speed you wanted to go and it would flash its little light if you went over it. And also a panel mounted compass. Plus it had a push system that shifted gears using a electro servo motor and it was called the Teletouch. Also important to mention, the Etzel had seat belts and child locks. And child locks were first a development by the Damsels of Design. If you've ever been curious about the group of ladies that Harvey Earl handpicked himself to be some of the first women in automotive design, I got a link down there for it. With all the hype, the Etzel show, the exciting new features, there was some substantial hype when the Etzel was revealed on September the 4th, 1957, AKA, E-Day. They called it E-Day, not me. Now, the hype did not translate into sales, and the Ford executives were positively miffed, baffled, that the Edsel wasn't selling. You see, they had been telling their investors, their consumers, press, anyone that would listen, that there was an absolute demand for this car, and they had figured that all out through their market research. So why was the Edsel not selling? Frankly, the car did not live up to the hype that Ford put out. Not in style, performance, or reliability. So let's talk about those issues. Now, when I mentioned styling, you probably knew I was gonna go straight to the grill, right? The grill was without a doubt a statement in styling, but not exactly in a desirable way. The grill was a very clear point in which the designers wanted to be distinctive, wanted to be different, but they just faltered in the execution of it. It just feels like basically they looked around at all the other conventional grills and they thought, you know what? These are all horizontal. Let's do the opposite. And unfortunately, they just couldn't pull it off like some of the other car makers of the day that were doing vertical grills. The Edsel grill looks like a horse collar or a bedpan. They just didn't pull it off. And frankly, consumers from all the hype that they had been being fed expected something a lot more 
in the future than what the Edsel was. Now, a big deal for reliability is there was a very intrinsic issue going on at the production line. You had the Edsel being produced on the same production line as Fords and Mercury's. Like you would have an assembly plant worker doing two Mercury's, one Ford, and then an Edsel. And that is not ideal for quality assurance. Workers would get mixed up in their assembly line. They would install the wrong part. They would install a part incorrectly, or they would forget to install a part entirely. And all that meant that their dealerships were getting haphazard cars and the dealers were not happy. Also, as far as features go, consumers didn't like the tell-it-touch. Ergonomically, it wasn't very thought out. And also, a lot of folks were used to that being where the horn was. So there was a lot of danger and risk of somebody trying to honk their horn and accidentally changing their gear. But aside from all of that, probably the worst thing that happened to the Edsel was being released in a recession. In the 1958 recession, the Edsel was introduced and quite possibly the second worst time after the Great Depression. And it wasn't just Ford or Edsel that took a beating. Every car maker was hit by this recession. And in 1959, Ford would announce the end of Edsel. Ford and its bean counters had all the reasons of, of why the Edsel should have been a success, but why wasn't it? If Ford had given the Edsel a little bit more time, could it have turned itself around? Because let's face it, it was not the worst car that's ever been made. Honestly, if they had held on to it a little bit longer, it probably could have survived. Maybe not thrived, but survived. I think that WizKid McNamara didn't like the initial failure staring him right in the face. And also, he was a, a very much a bottom line guy. So he also didn't want the Thunderbird to be made. What do you think? Could the Etzel have survived if it had given, you know, maybe five years? Do you like the styling? Like, I really, I, I like funky styling. Um, and so I'm okay with it, but I don't love it. And usually I love just about everything. All right, guys. Well, I hope you had a very good time with this little informal journey all about the Edsel it's automotive history. I'm going to go have a beer at our mechanic shop because it is absolutely beer 30. And I uh, hope you have a good day. If you like this kind of stuff, it's automotive history is your cup of tea. Press subscribe, press like, and if not, that's fine too. All right. Bye.